complete our discussion of the, uh, uh, the cyber witten theory. Um, we have, we, if you remember, before we took our break that was so long that you've probably forgotten all about it. Uh, if you remember, we had completed the discussion of all the physics of the cyber witten theory. What was left was the mathematics. Okay? Uh, and the other part that was left was the discussion of uh, confinement in the, uh, in the n equals 1 theory. So we'll try to go through these both today. Um, fine. So first, let's start with the mathematics. Um, let me remind you where we were when we took our break in our lectures. If you've forgotten all about this, you can go and look up the video lectures. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you remember, we had this complex plane, which was parameterized by this guy u, which was at least roughly trace phi squared. You remember what we were talking about, right? We were talking about an n equals 2 theory, SU2. Um, so in n equals 1 language, it had one chiral, one adjoint chiral multiplet and one, one vector multiplet. Um, you remember that uh, there was no superpotential for this uh, phi square, so there was a moduli space of vacuum. Okay, and uh, you remember that the uh, uh, expectation was that at low energies, we get an effective n equals one theory. Uh, sorry, we get an effective n equals uh, two theory, uh, which is u one, an effective u one n equals two theory, because of the Higgs mechanism, right? Because s u two, you turn on an adjoint field that's like a vector, it breaks s u two down to s u two down to u one, and uh, you remember that. Uh, um, N equals 2 supersymmetry told us that uh, the full action of this U1 theory was given in terms of a prepotential, right? This f of u, f of a, okay? And uh, we uh, defined uh, uh, these two quantities. We had del f by del a, which was a d, and then there was a itself. Okay, a was basically square root of u. Okay, there was del f by del a and a, and these two quantities, you remember, were interchanged under duality. We discussed this electromagnetic duality, which inter interchanged uh, electric and magnetic fi uh, gauge fields, and also interchanged a and a dual. Okay, and in particular, you remember that electromagnetic duality was an SL two z thing, because you could do g goes to one by g, but you could also go do theta goes to theta plus two pi. So g goes to 1 by g was tau goes to minus 1 over tau. And uh, theta goes to theta plus 2 pi was tau goes to tau plus 1. And these two together generated uh, some SL2Z sort of group. Okay. Now, our goal, if you remember, was to compute this prepotential f of u. Oh, equivalently to compute a of u and uh, a dagger of u, a, a d of u. Okay, and, and you, one last thing to, uh, that you, you want to remember is that the uh, metric, um, um, the metric for the gauge field, uh, also the metric for, this, for the um, effective scalar field, the uh, moduli space metric, was im tau. Okay, so uh, where uh, tau was equal to del a b by del a. I hope I got this right. Yeah, del a d by d and del a. Okay. And one last thing to remind you about was that uh, uh, much of the analysis, okay, when we, uh, to many things to remind you about. We deduced that there were two singular points in this moduli space. We deduced that this was a point where uh, a monopole went massless, and this was a point where a dion went massless. And you remember that one of the main reasons that we required singular points was that it was impossible to find a metric which had im tau greater than zero everywhere on this complex plane subject to the uh, uh, boundary conditions if we uh, did not allow for uh, at least two singular points. Two was necessary because of the Z2 symmetry in the theory. Okay? Now, so yeah, the, the, the fact that it was, uh, the fact that it was impossible to find this 
tau, which was an analytic function of u, such that its imaginary part was uh, positive everywhere, drove us into much of this analysis. The monodromy, uh, monodromy. It couldn't have, well, you see, one in the middle we argued was uh, uh, basically the kind of singularity that you would expect with uh, um, non abelian gauge fields. Okay? And we gave various reasons why we didn't expect that. Yeah. But, but you're right that but the other argument, as both of you are saying, is that that would make this whole thing uh, abelian and it would be impossible. We needed something non abelian. Hmm. But we had both a physical and a mathematical argument for this point of view, if you remember. OK, great. Now, so then we computed, assuming that the monopole went massless here, and the dion went, th then we were forced to have that the dion went massless here, because the net monodromy had to add up. We knew the monodromy at infinity, we computed it. We computed the monodromy around the monopole point, and then it had to uh, meet up. We, we deduce what went massless there. That was some particular dion. OK. And uh, because the monodr monodromy is here, are just governed by one loop diagrams of the monopole or the dion. OK. Uh, one loop diagrams of the monopole or the dion. We could compute those. Not just the monodromy, we could even compute you know, the behavior of, the, uh, of tau as a function of uh, uh, where we were. So we had good control over the semi-classical region of this U plane, okay, because that's where the theory was weakly coupled in terms of uh, the original degrees of freedom. Okay? And then we had uh, uh, control over what happened in, this, in the neighborhood of this and what happened in the neighborhood of this. This point. All of this you, we've worked out. So, now what I'm going to do is to just summarize what we know in terms of mathematics. And we're now going to have to confront this problem of dealing with this im tau cannot be greater than zero. Something that we've done here must solve that problem. How do we solve it? That's the question. Okay? So let me just write down what we know about our solution. We know, we know that near infinity, uh, all this we worked out including numbers quite painstakingly. Uh, near infinity, A went like uh, square root 2 u, and a dual went like uh, i square root 2 u by pi log u. This was essentially the beta function, uh, or the anomaly equivalently, of the, of the, of the semi-classical. Right near infinity, we had this behavior. Okay. We also know that near u equals one, where the monopole went past this. Okay. We have a d is um, a good coordinate, so it's c zero into u minus one, and a is the coordinate that that winds, so it's a zero. Uh, plus i by pi a d log a d. And there was a similar uh, similar uh, construction near u equals minus 1. OK? So we had these, this, this monodromy. These, these were basically the statements of the monodromies. As you go, went around it, a d went to a d plus 1, for instance, or a d plus a. You remember all that, right? OK, fine. We are now confronted with the issue of trying to find the prepotential, or equivalently trying to find A of u and AD, AD of u. This is what we, we need to do. OK, how we need to do that with the requirement that this imaginary part of tau is always greater than or equal to 0. How are we going to do this? Okay. Now, these guys, being ingenious people, uh, thought up an ingenious method. Okay? And this was their ingenious method. The first thing they realized, they noted, was that there is a natural geometrical context. There is a natural geometrical context in which 
you have a situation where you've got tau, an imaginary part of tau is greater than zero. And that natural geometrical context is this. Suppose I have a torus. This is the identification um, of the torus. Okay? And on this torus, I have this unique, well behaved holomorphic one form, which is dz. Note on a torus, you can't put anything you like because it won't match the periodicities. You put z dz, it will not be periodic. Okay, so you want it to be holomorphic, and uh, you know, well behaved, there's this unique holomorphic one form. Now, if you choose cycles to be oriented in the correct way, then this, the integral of dz divided uh, along this cycle, divided by the integral of dz along this cycle is 2 pi tau, that's the integral along this cycle, divided by 2 pi, which is the integral along this cycle, and therefore is equal to tau. Okay, so if you choose your um, your uh, cycles, which such that their orientation is, you know, this way rather than that way, then you're going to get from this a positive imaginary part. This is triviality. This is so far just definitions. Next comment to make is the following. Look, suppose I have some tau, it's got a positive imaginary part. And I perform an SL2Z transform on it. What happens to the imaginary part? Let's check. So SL2Z transform is one that, you know, does the uh, uh, mixing up of the cycles. Okay? And uh, as you know, under an SL2Z transform, um, uh, tau goes to a tau plus b over c tau plus d, a, b, c, d are all integers and uh, uh, a, b, c, d is determinant 1. And that's the s in the asset to that. a, b, c, d. Okay, so now let's see what happens to the imaginary part of tau under such a move. Well, okay, so if I want to compute the imaginary part of tau, it's irritating to have the denominator, so I'll make it real. So I'll make it a tau plus b into c. c and d are just integers. They, they're complex, they're their own complex conjugates. Tau bar plus d over mod c tau plus d root thing squared. Okay, now let's take the imaginary part of this. The only thing that is anything imaginary is tau and tau bar. Okay, so we get the imaginary part from tau, which is AD, but we also get from tau bar, which is BC, but with a minus. But the numerator is 1, that, that part is 1. So that's equal to m tau divided by c tau plus d mod square. And therefore, if the original m tau was positive, this remains positive. So this is slightly more non-trivial than the first observation. The observation was that an SL2Z transform, you know, preserves orientation in the sense that it takes positive imaginary tau to positive imaginary tau. Okay. So now we could imagine having this fantasy. Imagine that we've got this u plane. So I'll keep these conditions up here. Um, imagine that we've got this u plane. Okay. One minus one. And on each point on this plane, we've got some torus. The complex structure of the torus can vary as a function of u. Okay, so tau can vary. But um, if I can 
somehow arrange it so that this tau, uh, tau which was dAD by dA, which is the same as dAD by du by dA by du, if that tau was the complex structure of my torus, then it would automatically have imaginary part greater than 0. Now, all I need on this u plane is that we've got a bunch of tori that there is a well posed torus at the at the at each point. I don't need the representation of the torus to be single valued. So as I go around some point, it could be that the torus comes back to itself up your, up to some SL2Z transform. This will do for what I want because under SL2Z transforms, M tau remains its positive, retains its positivity. Okay, so this is now an, an sounding like a nice geometrical problem. We've got a torus on each point of this U plate. This torus could have monodromies when you come back around, but you come back to the same torus. Some cycle may have gone to some other cycle, but it's the same torus. No doubt, uh, uh, fiber bundle. I'm sure. If I knew what that was, I would say fiber bundle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, so this is the idea. Somehow we want to associate a torus with each point on the U-plane, and we want to associate some additional structures on that torus, so that eventually tau of the field theory. DAD by DA will turn out to be tau of the torus. Okay? That is the thing we're going to try. Now, oh no, it will be because it's always imaginary part of tau, uh, I mean, if defined correctly, is always imaginary. In in tau of the torus, which is positive. What we're going to do is to have a torus at each point, and we're going to take this this uh, holomorphic one form continuously varying. So it can't switch suddenly from plus to minus. So then it'll always be positive. Okay. Okay, so first we need to create a torus at each point on the U-plane. And then we need to do put some additional structures so that tau of the torus turns out to be tau of our field theory. That's the game. Okay, now first thing about this is this. There is apparently a theorem. It's not very hard to believe. I don't know about it, but it's not very hard to believe that there is a theorem which says this. Suppose you associate, suppose you've got a torus on a plane with some on a complex plane with some punctures. In our situation, the punctures are going to be one minus one in infinity. Punctures just means you can have monotonies around that point. Okay? And you specify the monodromies around the point and also specify the behavior in the neighborhood of the monotromies. Okay? Then tau of u is uniquely determined. That there is a, a if you want this to be a holomorphic problem, if you want a, a, ta, a, a torus whose tau will be holomorphic, but up to these SL2Z transforms, you know, tau doesn't need to be periodic, come back to itself up to SL2Z transforms. It's in a how do they say it? They say it's, a, it's an S, it lies in an SL2Z bundle, whatever, you know, all that fancy stuff. Okay, but it can come, come, can come back to itself up to, there's a gauge field. There's a flat gauge field, which is SL2Z valued and has Wilson values. Uh, okay, uh, okay, and um, uh, so the claim is, the mathematical claim from the study of elliptic curves is the following. Okay, that if I give you a torus on a punctured plane, I specify its monotromies, and I specify the, you know, behavior in the neighborhoods of the 
of these monodromy points, the puncture points. Okay? Then there is a unique tau as a function of u, given these values. So if you find one solution, you're guaranteed you got it. Okay? Now, this mathematical result uh, uh, is not too hard to believe, right? Right? Because you know, suppose there were two different solutions. Then the ratio of the two solutions would be something with trivial monodromy and trivial no singular behavior in the neighborhood of these points. And this is very much like our original statement that it was not possible to find uh, a torus with in tau less than zero if there was nothing funny happening. Okay? So the fact that if you find it, it's sort of unique. Of course, it's a theorem, and I don't understand the theorem, but it's not too hard to believe. So, sorry, but at least I believe that there was a different Yes. No, no. It tells you what happens to the torus as you come around. But you have different torus at each point. There's a different torus at each point. But when you come around, you come back to the same torus, but you may not have come with the cycles matching the same cycles. A cycle might have become B cycle. OK? That's the monodromy. So we've got a torus at each point, And it's not a, not a well-behaved, it's not a one-to-one -one map. So tau of u is not one-to-one. I mean, in the sense, not single valued. Okay? But it can come back to itself only up to an SL2Z transform. Because the physical torus hasn't changed. All that you've done is exchange two cycles. Yeah, but the theorem you were saying, I thought this property was of one torus. No. Three no, I'm talking about tau or as a function of u. Ah, just an analytic function. Analytic function, yes, 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 yes. Okay? Yeah, not on the torus. Right. So it's very important. There are two one complex dimensional spaces in this game. The torus and the U-plane. And it's easy to get them mixed up and we don't want to get them mixed up. Okay? U-plane is physical, the torus is in our head. But it's a very fruitful thing to have in our head. Okay? Excellent. So, <coughs> so now we've set ourselves the task. Let us find a torus at each point on the suplane. And some additional structures on that torus. What we'll come to. So that tau of the torus becomes our, our field theory tau. That is what we want to do. OK, clear? First thing we want to do is to find a torus um, on, uh, uh, on this U-plane. Now, you know, I don't know if, if, if you were not into algebraic geometry or whatever it's called, uh, you might start drawing diagrams or something like that at Taurus and you play Romeo, might start looking at Tau of you. But these algebraic geometers and Cyborg and Witten are clever people, and they have a very nice way of representing this Taurus. Let me tell you about this representation. Actually, by now, you know, now that we do so much entanglement entropy, it's not, it's not so unfamiliar. But I, at the time, it was at least I remember when I was reading it, I was like, well, this is a torus. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> where's the torus? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Consider the following curve. Curve is a word that uh, uh, people who do complex analysis use for a complex, you know, one. Uh, y is a function of z, uh, y is a function of, of, uh, of uh, x, where y and x are both complex. It's a curve, like it's a complex curve. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a surface, right? <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, so consider the cu uh, following curve. y <coughs> is equal to square root of, oh, so oh, let's say y squared then is equal to x minus 1 in x plus 1 in x plus u. Elliptic vibration, <laughs> no doubt. OK, so let's look at this. First thing we say, so 
the first thing, so remember that despite appearances, we've not written them as Z and W because we're imitating cyber goodness not notation. But Y and X are both complex numbers. Okay, so that there's an X complex plane and there's a Y complex plane. Okay, given where we are on the X complex plane, okay, where at a specified point almost on the Y, uh, y complex plane. Why almost? Because square root has a plus minus. Okay? So for every point in X, there are two possibilities for Y. Okay? So this whole, the whole surface here is a double cover of the X complex plane. Because Y could be something or something else. So two cover of the X complex plane. This is clear? Now, let us look at the places where, um, uh, let us look at the branch points of this square root. Okay, so, so, so if we write y is equal to square root of x minus 1 in x plus 1 in x plus u. Okay, it's clear that minus 1, 1, and u, I, have they written, really written x plus u? x minus u, naturally. And x equals u are branch points. But, but you know, there's a, there's a fourth branch point, namely infinity. Because um, at, uh, as x goes to infinity, it goes uh, like x cube. And so there's a flippant sign when you take that square root. Okay, so this cur this 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 thing here has four branch points, and you can imagine a branch structure in which the branch cuts are taken to be something like this: minus one to one, and say u to infinity. Now, because we are dealing with infinity, this looks sort of uncivilized, but of course we could stereographically project this this onto a sphere. Then it's just two branch cuts infinity is not different from any other point okay so what we've got is a sphere with two branch cuts now there's a double cover you know this, uh, this the mouth is sort of open at the branch cuts right uh, there's a double cover and this guy meets up with this guy so this guy here this guy here or turn it around and here and there Okay, so you see that topologically what we have is a sphere with something going, something going, so it's a torus. Okay, so this quantity here, this object here that doesn't look it, is a torus. And one different torus for every value of u. Okay, so this is the first thing, that it's a torus separate torus for each u. Next thing about this torus is this. Something funny happens to this torus when u goes to 1, minus 1, or infinity. Because then the branch points come next to each other. These are like the degeneration points of the torus. That's exactly why we've chosen this representation here. Because we know that our tori should become singular at u equals 1, minus 1, and infinity. We should get monodromies around these points. Okay? So we've got some representation. We've just written it down here. A representation of a torus. Then there's something funny happening. We haven't yet seen what funny. But something funny happening at u equals 1, minus 1, and infinity which is exactly what we want from our field. Is this clear? Please. So when, when you say that uh, the tori becomes singular at these points, do you mean that one of the cycles? It shrinks to zero. Okay. Yeah. It, it becomes a degenerate torus. Right? OK. Um, so good. Excellent. So now, now we've at least written down a torus, one for each value of u. Now the next thing is on this torus. Oh. One. It's a 
doctoras. Right? Can, can you imagine it? Imagine this like a, this, a tube joining this. So it's a sphere, like a balloon with two holes. Tube from the first balloon to the second balloon with two holes. Can you see it's a torus? Now then shrink up the balloon. Yes. OK. Those who like computing entanglement entropy, when you compute two cut entanglement entropy, you get tori. The same reason. OK. Excellent. Huh. Excellent. So uh, um, uh, 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 more, more precisely, when you com compute the Rennie entropy, second Rennie entropy with two cuts, you get a torus. If you compute the nth guy, I think you get bigger and bigger. And bigger, bigger. But we're looking at the double covers. Second Rennie entropy. OK, excellent. Um, very good. So now we want to now somehow put some structure on this thing. So that our field theory, so that our field theory, uh, tau will become the tau of the stars. How do we do that? Okay. The first thing we notice about this is the following. First thing we want to do, we've got this torus, and you know, it was really important to us to have this holomorphic differential on the torus. So we need to know here, on this space, what is our unique holomorphic differential. OK? Claim the unique holomorphic differential is dx divided by y. Is the unique holomorphic differential. Now, how do I know it's holomorphic? OK, it's holomorphic. Well, first, it depends only on x and y, so it's holomorphic. But there are possibilities that it has singularities. OK, well, the two possible places it could have singularities is y equals 0 or y equals infinity. OK, but just let's replace what y is. So this is dx divided by OK? At x equals infinity, it's very clear there's no problem. OK? It's, you might think that it's problematic because it's 1 over x to the power 3 by 2. And that's not an integer power. But remember that our space is a double cover. So on the double cover, it's single. Bit. And you go around twice, you come back to yourself, and that's what our space is. So on our space, on our torus, this is nice, and it goes to 0 at infinity, so no problem. OK? The thing you might worry about is that maybe near one of the branch points, one of the uh, uh, branch points here, x equals 1, uh, you could, get a, you could gen generate some sort of non-trivial integral of this differential going around a branch point. But you don't, right? Because it's dx by square root x. The integral of that is square root x. Again, that looks multi-valued, but that's not a problem because it's a double cover. On the torus. Previously, it started with x. It was here. Then it covered the torus. X was a, was a point on the complex plane. And we got a double cover of this complex plane. This was that double cover. Right? We've got these branch cuts. And as you go around through the branch cut, you come to the second sheet. And then you come back through the branch cut, you come back to the first sheet. We've got a double cover of the complex plane. So, the, so x is not a good coordinate on the, on the double cover. OK? That's why square root type things are allowed. Because the square root just tells you you're going to the next cover. Then you come back, though, it should be single valued. So anything with a half integer power is OK. It's regular. OK? So this guy. Do you think about it? All the integrals of this, anything are nice and never blowing up, never giving you something non-zero if you shrink it. Point. This is a holomorphic differential. I have never done it myself, but I presume one could, you know, take <coughs> take the torus and may 
make the uh, complex transform, the wild transformation that takes it to the standard torus and check that under that map this just becomes dz. This would be a, an exercise one could do, I have not done it but it looks reasonable and Cyberg it written assured us it is true. So, we will, we will take it that this is the uh, holomorphic, uh, this is the holomorphic um, uh, uh, differential. Now, Cyberg and Witten tell us one more thing that I knew nothing about until I read it in their paper, which is, you know, if you ask how many holomorphic differentials are there on a torus, obviously the answer is one, it is dz, okay. But Cyberg and Witten say, well, look at this character, lambda 2, which is x dx divided by y. This is not a well behaved differential everywhere because at x equals infinity it scales like, like uh, uh, Why isn't it? A good, uh, let's 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 see why it's not well behaved. Because this goes like x by x to the power three by two uh, dx divided by square root x. So this is goes like d of square root x. <laughs> so it picks up a big number. You know, it becomes very big because x is very large at infinity. Right. So if you you do a conformal transformation so that infinity becomes a finite region, this will be a blowing up. Uh, blowing up form. Nonetheless, the monodromy around infinity is zero because you have to go twice. Square root x is well is a single valued function. Okay? So Cyberg and Witten say say it this way: this is a blowing up differential, a holomorphic differential, which is not non-singular. It's got a singularity. But the kind of singularity it has is such that it's it is what do they, they say that, that, that it is residues vanish by which they mean you can never go around one of the monodromy points using this and pick up something non trivial. I mean uh, 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 you can never go around a shrinking cycle and pick up something non trivial because the only possibility here was, would be infinity we have checked that you never get something non trivial. Okay? So now on this space apart from this fundamental guy which is the genuine holomorphic differential. There is a second guy which will prove useful for us in intermediate steps. So there is lambda 1 and lambda 2. Okay, wonderful. Now, now what is the idea? The idea is this. The idea is, let us suppose we can find <coughs> Let us suppose we can find some lambda. Go on. Ah, because it's it, uh, around one. Let's let's do the integral. It's d of square root of x minus one. As x goes to one, this is zero. It doesn't blow up, right? It is a coordinate that goes to 0 near the point. Okay? You may worry that it is square root, but that is okay because it is double cover. Right? Okay. Great. Uh, so, 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 where were we? Yes. What we are, what our, our, uh, our, what we are going to try to do is to find lambda, is to find some one form which is let us call it, um, uh, let us call it, um, uh, let us use the notation, a1 of u lambda 1 plus a2 of u lambda 2. a1 and a2 are holomorphic functions. Okay. Now, the important thing about these lambda 1 and lambda 2 is the following. Okay. The 
<coughs> important thing about these lambda 1 and lambda 2 is because one of them is a regular differential one form, second one is not regular but has vanishing residue. For both of them, Cauchy's theorem applies. So if I take this one form and integrate it on some cycle, the answer only depends on which topological cycle I am integrating it on, not on which curve I am integrating it on, by Cauchy's theorem. Okay? So this is some what is important about this lambda, that it is a semi-topological object right, because of Cauchy's theorem. Now, what I am going to do is the following. You remember my U-plane had these two cycles. Let us call this first cycle, um, let us call this first cycle 1 and this second cycle, this one going to infinity, from U to infinity, 2. These are the A and B cycles of the torus, okay. And I will choose conventions, okay. Okay, so what I am going to do is this now. I am going to, what I am going to do is the following. I am going to choose A is equal to, uh, let us call this gamma 1 and let us call this gamma 2. A is equal to integral gamma 1 of lambda and A dual is integral gamma 2 of lambda. Okay? If I do this, then I am guaranteed, I do not need to give any more data. I just have to give the topological cycle because of the property of this lambda. And I am guaranteed that whatever I get will be a holomorphic function of u. So this construction, whatever it is, gives me a holomorphic A of u and holomorphic AD of u. And it is well defined because I do not need to specify more data than, than, the, cy than the cycles. Okay. Coming. We, we do not have, we do not yet know. We will we'll do it. Okay. Now is really the key point. The key point is this. Remember, remember that um, del d a d by d u divided by d a by d u is equal to tau of u the field theory term of you. Okay. So, if I can choose, okay, if I can choose uh, lambda so that choose lambda, this coming to the criterion, if I can choose lambda so that d lambda by du is equal to some f of u times lambda 1. Suppose I am able to make the, such a choice, okay. Then from this choice let us evaluate what tau evaluates to, okay. Um, now, uh, now um, we have A, so let us substitute. We have D by DU of integral lambda gamma 2, that was DAD by DU. So tau of U is equal to this, divided by D by DU of integral gamma 1 lambda by definition. But I can take these in the only thing that depends on u is lambda. So then this is same as d lambda by du. Okay, uh, d lambda by du. And by, you know, I have managed somehow to choose d lambda by du as f of u lambda 1. So then this is equal to f of u divided by f of u into integral lambda 1, uh, lambda 1, gamma 1 by lambda 1, gamma 2. 
okay? But that's equal to integral lambda 1 gamma 1 by lambda 1 gamma 2. But remember that this was the unique holomorphic two form, uh, one form. So this is the tau of my torus. The holomorphic one form integrated on the two cycles. The ratio of the two was tau of the torus. So if I am able to find the lambda such that d lambda by du is f of u lambda 1 for any analytic function of u, then I am guaranteed that my tau of u that I get out of this will always have positive imaginary part because it becomes identified with the tau of the torus. Okay? So now we have greatly simplified our task. Our task is now to find, all we have to do is to find a lambda of this form such that d lambda by du is proportional to lambda 1. What? Well, no, a2, it's d lambda by du that's a lambda 1. Uh, you, you will see, to find lambda, we will need lambda 1 and lambda 2. d lambda by du will be just lambda 1, proportional to lambda 1. But lambda itself will not be proportional to just lambda 1. But the only thing we need, we could have taken it to But we also have to uh, uh, get the monodromies right, and we have to get the singularities around <laughs> the monodromies and those singular. The singular. We have to get many other. Apart from this imtau, we have to uh, obey the other boundary conditions. So it's a very tight problem. So we give ourselves the maximum space we have, so as to be able to try to solve. Try to be able to solve it. Okay. Good. And then. Uh, the remaining method is uh, for solving this question is guesswork. Just look at it and find the answer. <laughs> okay? So, here. Uh, choose lambda equals square root 2 by 2 pi bx square root x minus u pi square root of x square minus 1 which is the same thing as square root 2 by 2 pi uh, <coughs> dx <coughs> this is x minus u uh, dx y divided by x square minus 1 okay suppose we choose this lump Okay. First, why are these two things the same? Well, we just plug in y, right? y was square root of x minus 1 into x plus 1. So a square root of x square minus 1 times square root of x minus u. Uh, so that square root of x minus u gets absorbed in this y. And the extra square root of x minus 1 into x plus 1 is the, the additional factor that has made this you know, non-square uh, non rooted. Okay. Okay? Suppose we, cho we choose this lambda. Okay? Now, having chosen this lambda, uh, I want to claim A that it's of this form. What, what, what? I could have rewritten. I, I've written it in this form because I want to. Uh, presumably because I want to rewrite it in terms of this lambda 1 and lambda, oh, by, by y, you're probably right. You're probably right. You're probably right. Yeah, 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 you're right. Okay. So exercise, we can check that lambda is equal to square root 2 of lambda 2 minus u lambda 1 by 2 pi. Okay. Just by plugging in what lambda 2 and lambda 1 is. Okay, let's 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 do that check. Um, uh, this is square root two. Lambda two was what was it? X dx by y minus u lambda 
uh, dx by y. So let's say by 2 pi. OK. So this is, I think, what Sunil was saying. The square root 2 by 2 pi into um, x minus u dx divided by square root of x square minus 1 into x minus u. And then that's the same as this one. Right? So first, first claim is that this lambda is of the form we wanted. Namely, it was a linear combination with holomorphic coefficients of these two, uh, um, these two sort of one form kind of uh, things. The holomorphic one form and the one with vanishing residues. But the really key thing about this lambda is its derivative. Let's take the derivative of this lambda with respect to u. OK, so we take the derivative of this lambda with respect to u. We get minus square root 2 by 2 pi uh, dx divided by square root of x square minus 1 into x minus u, uh, and maybe an extra half, right? 4 pi. Hmm. But that is equal to minus 2 square root 2 by 4 pi times lambda 1 because this is y. So this meets that condition. OK, so we found a lambda that meets these two conditions. Now we have to find, uh, check that this lambda also obeys the other physical conditions of the problems, the one that Diksha was talking about, namely monodromies, Equivalently, what the behavior is near as for A and AD, as uh, x goes to, um, as uh, u goes to 1, u goes to minus 1, and u goes to infinity. OK. But you see, we know what A and AD is. Because A was integral of lambda over gamma 1. OK. And, uh, um, a d was integral of lambda over gamma 2. OK, so A is, so since we know what lambda is, OK, A of u is integral over gamma 1 of what, what is lambda. Let's write it as uh, um, This is what it is. Okay. Now that we we know what this is, we can evaluate this. Okay. Because what we've got is this. You remember that gamma one was the cycle that went from around this thing. But what we've got is a cut here. So there's a discontinuity across the cut. So we can shrink the curve and pick up only the discontinuity across the cut. Right. So. The, doing that, we get that A of u, and maybe there's some i, i square root 2, maybe some 2 pi as well. L uh, let's see. So the, the discontinuity is um, i pi, right? OK, so there's um, i pi by 2 pi. I may have got a minus sign of uh, dx by x minus u into 1 minus x squared, square root from minus 1 to 1. Now this is not some fancy complex integral. It's a real integral from minus 1 to 1. It's some hypergeometric function, OK? It's some, something, but it's very explicit. OK, now that we've got this, we can simply check whether um, uh, a behaves at both at infinity and near 1 like it should. OK, so let's check near infinity. A should behave like 2 square root u. But near infinity, this x minus u, uh, OK, 
let me depend on Cyborg and Witten for signs and i's. Because I should be taking, this will give me another factor of i, right? Very good, infinity. OK, uh, let me depend on them for uh, lambda 1. They got a is square root 2 by pi dx x minus u over x squared minus 1. We've got a slightly different, how did they? What? I wrote 1 minus x squared because we want, we are looking at discontinuity. Right? Uh, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but this pi, have I got this pi wrong? This one. Yeah, pi I got wrong, right? Because the, the, it's a square root thing. So it's just 1 and minus 1. So the discontinuity was not pi. It's just 2. So uh, it was square root 2. So there should be square root 2, then there's an additional factor of 2. OK, so there's 2 uh, pi. And now there's some i somewhere. Yeah. Uh, two cancels. Yeah, so this is a good one. OK, fine. So now we take u to be very large. And I, here I need some i, uh, plus minus i, because of this 1 minus x. It discontinued is an imaginary part, right? right? OK, so this thing becomes basically square root of minus u which is square root of u times i. We have to think hard about whether that plus i or minus i do all that. But you get basically square root 2 by pi times integ times square root u times minus 1 to 1, 1 over 1 minus x squared. And no doubt this int integrates to pi. Sine inverse. Sine inverse. So pi cancels, so you get the square root, square root 2 times u. OK, great. This is what we had as u went to infinity. But we have something more non-trivial needed here. Right? Near u equals 1, <coughs> a had to be 2 square root u, square root of 2 u times log u. That's, that's uh, ad at infinity. Oh, that's ad at infinity. Sorry, you're right. Um, here, this one. So here, let's plug in. We don't, regular terms we don't care about. But a should go like i by pi uh, ad, which is u minus 1 times some constant, u minus 1 log of u minus 1. This is what we should see, right? We should see uh, without any fixed coefficient, but the u, u minus 1 log u minus 1 uh, behavior. And uh, that is, of course, also easy to check. So let's check it. OK. So first thing about this is the following. Suppose u goes to 1. OK. Suppose u goes to 1, so this is what we should be looking at. Suppose u goes to 1, ah, let's derivative, take derivative with respect to u. You see, that quantity here was, went to 0 as u went to 1, but it had the property that its derivative blew up like a log. OK, so what we really want to check is that dA by du, as u goes to 1, has a log divergence. OK, but take this. You see what, what it becomes is integral dx divided by square root of x minus 1. The square root of x plus 1 is about, it's not important. The square root of x, plus, x, x minus 1 times square root of x minus u. As if u was set equal to 1, yes. we would have a logarithmic divergence. Yes. Clearly, if u is a little bit away from 1, the logarithmic divergence is regulated, becoming log u. And one can do that more seriously. OK, so you take derivative and you get the right, you get the right value. 
And everything we've done for A, we can also do for AD. Now it's an integral not from minus 1 to 1, but from u to infinity. Similar tricks we can play. And check that, uh, uh, that we're all good. OK? So this um, <coughs> bag of tricks completes the solution. The solution was obtained in the end by guesswork. But you know, it was guesswork of a high, high sophistication. <laughs> you think of the store, as if you think in the right way, then it's easy to get, guess the answer. It's an amazing thing. Okay, since this solution, there are of course many more physical ways of getting this answer. It always happens. Somebody gets an answer and then you find other. Uh, maybe in our course we'll go through some of them. These curves, M, M5 brain curves. D3 brains and M5 brains. It's a very beautiful way of getting these solutions. Uh, so there are, there, there are ways, because you relate this curve to a geometrical curve in space time, in M theory. You know, something actually being on that curve, not just some auxiliary curve. Okay, maybe we will, let's see, if we go through this Gaiotto kind of business, we'll, we'll discuss that. But uh, uh, this was the first time it was totally spectacular. Uh, a simple explicit answer for the prepotential of our theory. Okay? So, in some way, this completes what we wanted to do. But there are two or three things that, uh, uh, that we want to go back and uh, look at, or look at again. So, but first, is it clear that this completes the solution of the model? Right? We found explicit answers for A and AD. Um, Hardcore people have written them in terms of hypergeometric functions. As far as I'm concerned, the integral is more illuminating than the hypergeometric function. <laughs> Meaning you want to know what happens as you go to one, you can see it from the integral, from the hypergeometric. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. But uh, 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 so this is it. And Cyborg and Witten, being people of taste, did not even write down the hypergeometric. This integral. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Is it clear that we've completed the solution of our problem? Okay, you see that in the end, <coughs> the solution was very simple. It was not like we had to use some powerful book on differential equations. Uh, it's very simple. The functions that are appearing are very simple functions, square roots. Most complicated thing is a square root. It's not even a sine or a tan or something. You know? uh, it was a very simple solution. Well, the sophistication lay not in the algebra but in the conceptualization. What did you have to do to get the solution? Once you've got that clear, the solution's very simple. Okay? Excellent. Uh, excellent. Im tau goes to zero, no. No place here. Yeah. Because uh, that's by construction. This is always integral dz of gamma one or for torus. So ne never. Okay? However, what I thought you were going to ask me, Sunil, which was the next point I was going to come to, uh, is this. Something else that you've already forgotten because I was so lazy and we didn't have class for two months or so, uh, is this. You remember we discussed the BPS algebra and these theories. You remember that we had a central charge central charge, which was A times the electric charge, plus AD times the magnetic charge. And you remember that when we, when we did that analysis, we argued that as long as A and AD were not proportional to each other as complex numbers, then any variation that we did on the space of U's cannot change the BPS spectrum of the theory. So if you're, you're a theory at a given value of u, and you've got some BPS particles, then that spectrum of particles cannot change if um, your change does not take you through a place where A and AD are proportional to each other as complex numbers. Do you remember this? The idea was that um, when A and AD became proportional to each other, then a dion, something carrying Q units of electric charge and QM units of magnetic charge, at exactly that point, 
have the same energy as Q unit 1 electric charges yes. and Qm unit 1 magnetic charge. So it could decompose into um, W bosons and monopoles. Everywhere else, if you had a dion, it has less energy than the sum of monopole and uh, uh, W boson. So it could not decompose. <coughs> so an interesting question in our theory, uh, an interesting question for us is this. Now that we know A and AD, we can ask, do A and AD ever become proportional to each other's complex numbers? Because if that happens, that is what people call a line of marginal stability. It's a place where one, end, one side of that line, other side of that line, the BPS spectrum might be different. Okay? So, question, does it happen that uh, A and A uh, dual ever become, um, uh, yeah, uh, ever become proportional to each other? Okay. So let's write down the formulas for A and A dual again. Okay. So we had A was equal to square root 2 by pi dx square root of x minus u over square root of x square minus 1. Okay, and A dual uh, was equal to um, square root 2 by pi into 1 to u square root of x minus u divided by square root of x square minus 1. Uh, yeah, why not? Why one? Oh, uh, wait, one minute. What? What was the second cycle? Sorry, I said it. I probably said it wrong. But just a minute. Uh, what were our two cycles? Let me get that straight. Mm. Ah, I said it wrong. Right? Let's go back to a picture of the balloons. Suppose I have this and this, and joining another one here. If I take something surrounding this guy and take something surrounding this guy, you see it's the same cycle. So the second cycle is not u to infinity. It's 1 to u. I said it wrong. It has to go the other way around. It has to intersect this one. Sorry, that, that was not u to it. I just said it wrong. That was 1 to u. Every time I said u to infinity, erase that, it's 1 to u. <laughs> okay, you see that geometrically, right? It's very clear. Okay, excellent. So, now let's, <coughs> uh, let's look at this in special cases. Let us first take u is, uh, greater than 1 on the real axis. Okay? So if we have u is greater than 1 on the real axis, then let's look at this guy. Um, uh, this fellow is from 1 to u, and so x is less than u. So this is imaginary. This fellow is 1 to u, x is greater than 1, so this is the real. Okay? So AD is equal to imaginary. On the other hand, if we take u greater than 1, this is imaginary and this is imaginary. Okay? So this is real. Uh, 
maybe there's a plus minus ambiguity. <laughs> but uh, reality is fine. Yeah, yeah, you're thinking complex. Yeah. OK. So we see that for u greater than 1 on the real axis, um, they never become proportional to each other. Similarly, you can convince yourself that for u less than 1 on the real axis. The same, same happens. Uh, this is uh, uh, Let's see. If u is less than 1, then uh, uh, this guy is positive. Less than minus 1. Uh, so this guy is positive. So that's real. And this guy is continues to be negative. So that's imaginary. So then, then this is imaginary. Whereas this fellow becomes a, a Oh, this fellow becomes what? So u is negative. So this is ah. So this is positive because this is a smaller negative number than this, than this positive number. And therefore minus u. Wait. Clear, right? This is a positive number, and this is a smaller negative number. Uh, okay. Uh, whereas this guy remains positive, so this becomes real. So in both cases, from u is equal to 1, 1 to infinity and u is equal to minus 1 to infinity, a and ad are never proportional to each other. This is clear. So one thing we realize immediately is that on this, uh, <coughs> on this moduli space, if we go from here to infinity like this, or we go from here to infinity like this, okay? Then the spectrum of BT BPS particles cannot change. But we know that there are monopoles at this point in the spectrum of BPS particles. And we know that there are ions at this point in the spectrum of BPS. So this picture has got to be consistent here. It better be true that at infinity, namely semi-classically, there are also monopoles and ions. But that is true. There are monopoles and ions of discharge from semi-classical analysis. The monopole is the tov polyamorkov monopole, and the dion, I never reviewed that for you guys, but it's obtained by quantizing this, uh, uh, take the monopole and quantizing a gauge, a circular gauge degree of freedom. Maybe in the next class I'll briefly review this. It's a beautiful thing. So uh, what I wanted to say is that semi-classical analysis from semi-classical analysis, we know the spectrum of BPS particles at infinity. So it's a consistency check that the BPS particles that exist here must also exist at infinity. The BPS particles that exist here must also exist at infinity. And it's a true consistency check. So and these particles are diodes? Yes. This was monopole. This was dion. So monopole must survive, and it does. Dion must also survive, and it does. OK? In fact, uh, you can say more. Once you have this dion, the, the, the dion that we have is magnetic charge 1 and electric charge 2. But once you have that dion, there must also be a dion of magnetic charge 1 and electric charge 4 at infinity. Because if you remember, the monotony at infinity took theta to theta plus 2 pi. And then by the Witten effect, changed the electric charge of magnetically charged particles by, in, in a way, proportional to the magnetic charge. So once you have a monopole, you're guaranteed you must have dions of all even charges. Okay, This was a dion of charge 2 electric, 1 magnetic. <coughs> and uh, whether you call it that or something else will depend on your SL2R frame. Okay, And that exhausts the spectrum of semi-classical BPS states. So the monopole and its, you know, this theta shifts 
which were basically this diode and then all the rest, exhausts the spectrum of uh, semi-classical BPS states. Okay, so it's really very nice that the things that go massless lie in the semi-classical BPS spectrum of the theory. In retrospect, it would have been a contradiction had they not, because of this property that there is a path going from the singular alarity to infinity um, um, along this, this line. Yes. Here at these points, they become massless. Okay. They become massless in this. At these points, remember the the masses are proportional to a and a dual. Mm -hmm. This point, a dual goes to zero. So the monopole becomes massless. Right? That that was what was special about these points. Mm -hmm. That the BPS states which existed become. Okay. More seriously, one can analyze when does a and a dual become proportional to each other. People have worked out the curve and it looks something like this. Cyber couldn't work it out in the neighborhood of these points. And okay, so when one goes through this circle, the, the curve some detailed structure, but when one goes through this roughly rough circle, the spectrum of BPS particles can and in general will change. Okay? This is why it is not necessary that our spectrum is SL2 R invariant. You see, actually not SL2 R. The, if you take the product of this, these three monodromies that we get around here, this thing generates a subgroup of SL2 R called gamma 2, which is SL2 R matrices where uh, I think all matrices are uh, 1 mod 2 or something like that. Some, some particular subgroup of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of SL2 R. And had there been no curves of marginal stability, it would have then meant that we could have started with, you know, we could have taken a particular state and then performed any gamma 2 rotation on it and got a state like that. And then that would have been the prediction that the spectrum of BPS states would have to fall into a representation of gamma 2, which is a huge thing and it's not true of semi-classical analysis. Okay? The fact but we cannot go around this monodromy. We cannot access this monodromy or this monodromy without going through the curve of marginal stability. So we cannot conclude that these monodromies map BPS states to BPS states because of the curve of marginal stability. Okay. However, we can conclude that this monodromy maps BPS states to BPS states, and that is just a correct statement about the spectrum of diodes. Okay, so Witten uh, ends the paper with, with these observations. Uh, uh, it's a bit poignant, you know, in two minutes of history. Um, in the early 19, in the late 1970s, Montonin and Al uh, Olive um, suggested that QCD might be self-dual, might have it. G goes to one by G, G R. Invariance, and this proposal was savaged by Witten and others, who pointed out that the proposal made no sense for many reasons, many many reasons. One of which was that the spectrum of BPS particles did not fall into representations of SL two Z. Okay, as you know, the correct, you know, th this is one of these lessons, right? Things in physics are not, sometimes not just wrong or right. They're more or less right. And in the case of Montanan and Olive, it turned out to be right, but not for QCD, but for N equals 4 angles. Uh, one of Ashok's great contributions to physics is that he showed that the semi-classical spectrum had the properties needed, needed for uh, SL2Z. But N equals 2 angles did not have this property, does not have this property. This is something Witten had worked on as a young man. Um, so he points out that uh, the line of marginal stability is what allows duality in these, <coughs> these SL2R kind of moves in this theory without having the spectrum <coughs> being invariant under SL2R or its, its appropriate subgroup. You know, so it's 
coming back after 15 years for Vitanavta about something. He tried. OK, fine. So this is what I wanted to say about curves of marginal stability. These curves of marginal stability, by the way, are um, um, quite generic features of um, theories with the, an, a moduli space of an appropriate nature. And uh, they sometimes are quite important. They an important role in black hole microstate counting, for instance. OK, last thing I wanted to say was this. The last thing I want to say, and then we can go and eat lunch, is that the title of this paper was, the title of the Cyborg Witten paper was, Electromagnetic Duality, Monopole Condensation and Confinement in N equals 2 Supersymmetric Yagnon's Theory. Electromagnetic duality we've seen, but I've almost gone through the whole paper, and where is this monopole condensation and confinement? Okay, so that's the last thing I have to, it's in the title of that paper we have to discuss it, right? <laughs> okay. So, in this part of the paper, which is not so quantitative, but is, uh, Physically interesting. Okay. Um, Cyborg and Witten ask the following. They ask, suppose I take my original UV theory, which you remember, and I add to it plus a superpotential, d2 theta m uh, square uh, m traced by the whole thing. OK, so what is this theory? First thing, we've, uh, we've done something sort of unpleasant. We've lowered the symmetry of our theory. Our original theory was n equals 2 supersymmetric. But now we've added a superpotential. So that uh, superpotential for, uh, um, for the chiral multiplet that was part of the n equals 2 vector multiplet. You remember the n equals 2 vector multiplet was an n equals 1 vector multiplet and an n equals 1 chiral multiplet, uh, chir chiral multiplet in the adjoint. And what we've done is to take a, a superpotential for this, uh, uh, this thing. So we bro we've broken symmetry from n equals 2. We've reduced the supersymmetry of the theory from n equals 2 to n equals 1. OK. Now, what should we expect? Um, the IR theory to be in this case. This actually we've already discussed when we discussed cyber duality. Because at least when M is taken to be very large compared to all other scales in the problem, it's not it's like not having the adjoint supermultiple. So it's like having pure Yangmill's theory. Pure n equals one Yangmill's theory. And you remember that pure n equals one Yang uh, Yangmill's theory when we in our discussion of cyber duality we talked about how it had um, NC vacua. It had this. Uh, it had this uh, uh, U2N symmetry. The th the thing that survived from the uh, uh, anomalous symmetry. Uh, no, it had a U2N, which was spontaneously broken to Z2. The UV symmetry was U2N, uh, and was spontaneously broken down to. Uh, uh, down to Z2, and then therefore there were NC vacua. Okay, in this case we've got SU2, so N is two. We had a Z4 symmetry, which we expect to be spontaneously broken down to Z2. We expect to get confinement, chiral symmetry breaking, all that good stuff. Okay, <coughs> and that looks very different from the physics we've seen here, right? Because the physics we've seen here. Okay, the physics we've seen here is that of um, um, U1 gauge field, U1 n equals 2 multiplet. Now, that U1 n equals 2 multiplet um, had 
its A field. Adding this trace phi square to it is like adding u to the superpotential of that low energy theory because u was trace phi square. Right? So what we would what should we naively expect if we take the cyber gooden picture? What we should naively expect is that we've got a d2 theta times u added to whatever low energy theory we had. Now this d2 theta times u uh, maybe will make the scalars in the vector multiplet massive and their corresponding fermions. But it doesn't look like it can affect the u1 gauge field. So if we were naive, we would predict from the cyber witten analysis that the low energy effective theory, once we add this trace phi square, has massless degrees of freedom in it. In particular, the massless u1 gauge. How can these two things be reconciled? We have you know, very strongly expect that at least when the mass is large enough, we expect confinement. Okay. Whereas if we take the cyborg witten picture and we just add a mass, it looks like it gets rid of the, the scalar fields, but the gauge boson, the U1 gauge boson seems unaffected because scalar fields are uncharged under the gauge boson. Okay. So what's going on? Okay. So cyborg witten have this uh, lovely insight. Uh, in fact, when I started these lectures, I started with this. I, again, this is in prehistory, so you don't remember. But uh, <coughs> I started with reminding you of Toft's picture of how confinement happens in QCD from the condensation of monopoles. Now, there's a monopole playing an important role in the game here. So perhaps this monopole, perhaps this monopole will condense. Let's see how that works. Okay. So what Cyborg Witten do is this. Uh, <coughs> they say, let us for a moment <coughs> ah. okay. uh, let us for a moment work in the neighborhood of u equals one. This is the place where the monopole is light. It becomes massless at u equals one. Okay. So let us, uh, for a moment, work in the in the neighborhood of u equals one, and include all relevant fields in the problem, not just the massless degrees of freedom that we see on the moduli space, but also the light monopole. Okay. Now, if we want to work with the light monopole, we better dualize to work in the frame where the gauge boson is adual, so that we can write down Lagrangian for the monopole. But fine, no problem. We'll do that. Okay. So we do that, and then we write down uh, the effective superpotential of the theory. Okay. Effective superpotential turns out to be W is equal to. I'll write it and then explain it. Square root two a dual uh, m tilde um, okay, where m and m tilde were the scalars in the monopole multiplet. So the monopoles come in this hyper multiplet. Uh, I don't think we've really discussed that. But in an n equals 2 theories, you have two kinds of multiplets. You have the vector multiplet, which we've discussed in great detail, because it's got an n equals 1 vector multiplet and n equals 1 chiral multiplet. There's also a second kind of multiplet, which is a hyper multiplet, okay? which is two n equals 1 chiral multiplets. Okay. And the two m equals one chiral multiplets are the two complex fields, m and m tilde. And when we write down the Lagrangian of uh, 
uh, this n equals 2 theory with the hypermultiplet in n equals 1 language. Okay. Um, such a term appears in the superpotential. Where ADUL is the scalar in the vector multiplet, the U1 low energy vector multiplet. Is this clear? Okay, oh, the chiral multiplet of that. So now there are three chiral multiplets. That's, there's, um, uh, there's the chiral multiplet that was the partner of the n equals 2 gauge field, the U1 gauge field. The, and then there are the two chiral multiplets that made up the hyper multiplet of the monopole. Okay? And if you just wrote down the super, uh, just like the super potential of the theory for the, uh, um, the theory with just the vector multiple, it was completely determined by super semantics. When you add hyper multiplets also, it's completely determined by, super, by the n equals 2 super semantics. So this is before turning on a mass deformation. This was the super potential that you, that you had in your theory. Is this clear? Sorry, I've said it, I feel confusingly. It's a very simple statement, uh, but is it clear? Let me say it one more time. We now, what we have is a theory with a U1 gauge field interacting with two charged chiral scalar fields. Their charges are plus one and minus one, M and M tilde. Okay? They come together to make a N equals two hyper, hyper multiplet. And that the n equals 2 supersymmetry completely determines the superpotential under u1. Right? Because we've gone to the dual frame, so the monopole is just an ordinary charge field. Okay? So there's a chiral multiple of charge 1, a chiral multiple of charge minus 1. And then there is this neutral chiral multiple that was, uh, that was uh, the superpartner of the, uh, the n equals 2 superpartner of the u1 gauge field. Is this clear? So we have three chiral multiplets in the game. Originally, we had only one. A dual, right? Uh, it was the this U field. Originally, we had only one. But now, because we've got these monopoles in the game as well, we've got two more. Clear? And then we add plus M U. And U is some, uh, because U is trace phi square. And uh, we think of U as being a function of A dual by inverting the map. We know a dual as a function of u, so we can write u as a function of a. Now, this is the superpotential only classic. You know, this is what it was, and then this is what you added. But by using cyber type arguments, this decoupling, you can argue this is the exact superpotential. Exactly the same kind of arguments we went through many times while, uh, while looking at adding masses to Afflictine cyborg. Okay, same kind of arguments. Okay. So now we've got <coughs> we've got the superpotential. Uh, the the uh, the non-renormalization, you mean? No, the superpotential. This superpotential we got by n equals two, and this is what we added because we turned on an extra m trace phi square. So classically, this is the addition, and then there's a non-renormalization theorem that tells you it cannot be changed quantum mechanics. Okay, it's the same kind, holomorphicity, charges matching, and then you go to places where you know it cannot change. Yes. This is that same old story. Okay, it's detailed in the cyber world. What? R, yeah, but very simple, kind of just charges here. Yeah, right, R symmetry is used. It has to be something of R symmetry too, yeah. that, all of that, and we could go through it, but it's a simple argument. Okay. Uh, it would just distract us from the main point. Let's get to the main point. Okay. Now, let us write down the equations of motion that follow from the superpotential. Okay. First, we get um, del, let's vary with respect to AD. So, we get square root 2 m m tilde plus m del u by del AD equals 0. This is one equation. Next equation is square root 2 AD M tilde uh, is equal to 0, varying with respect to M. And square root 2, what? U uh, is a function only of AD. Yes, so when I vary with respect to M, this is mass, this is a parameter. 
it's not the monopole field. Sorry. Yeah. Right? This is the parameter with which you define the theorem. I'm sorry about that. Okay. And uh, A D M is equal to zero. Okay. These are the equations of motion from that follow, follow from the W, from the super, super potential. There are also d term equations of motion. The d term equations of motion, the d term, if you remember, was for U1 theory was sum over charges times mod was of this form, right? Ei squared mod. Okay? Uh, in this case, one of them has charge 1, one has charge minus 1. So you get that the equation is that mod m is equal to mod m tilde. So that the d term vanish. <coughs> right? So these are our equations that we have to solve. Okay. Let us first look at the case m is equal. So we have two kinds of solutions. Let's suppose we have m is equal to 0. Little m is equal to 0. OK. Then from this equation, we want m times m tilde is equal to 0. From here, m and m tilde will individually be equal to 0. OK. And all these equations will be obeyed. AD can be anything you want. That is the original cyborg witten solution. All the monopoles were 0. And A dual, which this is this U plane. Right? That takes us back to the analysis we've been studying for the last eight lectures. However, let's say now little m is not equal to zero. That's what we're trying to do new here. Uh, since little m is not equal to zero, okay, um, since little m is not equal to zero, um, this quantity here. Okay, uh, we get another class of solutions. If we assume A B is zero, okay, if we assume A B is zero, and del U by del A B is something, which will tell you what this M M tilde is. Will be some constant. It'll be to leading order. It will be some constant, then there will be some AD squared and so on. AD, you know, okay, whatever it is, just something. Okay. What does that mean? It means that M and M tilde are not equal to zero. Right? What that means is that the monopoles have condensed. If the monopoles have condensed, then the gauge boson becomes massive because of the Higgs mechanism for the gauge boson, the dual gauge boson. But Higgs mechanism for dual gauge boson is confinement for the original gauge boson. Just like in a superconductor, electric charges condense, confining magnetic heats. This is the reverse of that. Okay? So what we see is this that if we assume that the correct vacuum, and sort of it's forced on us, the correct vacuum has m equals m tilde not equal to zero. As long as this is non-zero at the place where it is, you know, if we make that one assumption, then we are forced into monopole condensation happening. And therefore confinement happening. But in this extremely simple and semi-classical way. Now the confinement, now this picture really works in the neighborhood of the place where the monopoles become massless. Okay. For m and m tilde to be zero, we'd require, say little m is not zero. You'd have to have this to be non-zero. Okay? But these equations will require both AD is, AD is equal to zero. So at the point where AD is not equal to, uh, equal to zero, if its derivative is not equal to zero, which generically it is, oh, we can check from the Cyborg-Witten solution. It's not equal to zero. 
is we can invert u and find dt. So monopole condensation happens. Okay. And so in the neighborhood of this of this monopole point, we find this extremely simple explanation for the confinement of the n equals 1 theorem. We go to a dual frame and it becomes classical physics in the dual frame. Monopole exists all the way. So this argument can work. Yeah. Now, presumably it's always true. Presumably it's always true. Now all the way, now what, what does? You see, now once we're in this vacuum, AD is no longer, AD is just 0. You know, so that moduli space has been lifted. This is in a branch of vacua where there are no further, there's no further moduli space. I suppose what you could ask is, suppose I take m to infinity, instead of it being small, so that the theory genuinely becomes n equals 1 theory. Can I quantitatively describe that n equals 1 theory in the semi-classical language? I think that's very unlikely, except for very protected. U is U and AD are related to each other. Remember, we found AD as a function of U. So if AD is zero, U is something fixed. In fact, it's plus one now. AD is zero only at U equals plus one. Right? So uh, in this new vacuum, there's no elsewhere. But now you can Well, M is some fixed moduli space. Like its expectation value is fixed by this equation. Okay? So it's a fixed, which is what we expect, right? We expect N equals 1 theory to have a unique vacuum. Okay, now you could ask, what about the two vacua? And these two vacua are supposed to be the vacuum where the monopole condenses and the vacuum where the diagonal condenses. You remember we had Z4 symmetry spontaneously broken down to Z2. Okay, the Z2, if you remember, was the same Z2 that we had in our game, and it flipped the monopole and the diode. So these two different vacua, one in which the monopole condenses, and one in which the diode condenses. So look, recall now that in this case, there's no moduli space. There's just two vacua. This analysis for the monopole and this analysis for the diode. And that is qualitatively the correct uh, physics for n equals 1 Yangle's theory, because we get confinement, we get no moduli space, we have two vacua, and all of this is coming out semi-classically. It's quite amazing. But I don't really know what it's going to use. I mean, <laughs> I don't, you know, what would be really cool would be to, I don't know, compute the, um, to use this somehow to compute the string tension of n equals 1 Yangle's theory, or something like that. I think it's too much to hope for. You know, because very supersymmetrically protected quantities you can follow from this point to large mass. But for any really interesting quantity, like the string tension, it sounds unlikely. And now it's been, I don't know, 27 years. I don't think anyone's used it for that kind of physics. So it's not gone beyond a cartoon for explaining. Uh, the dynamics of the genuine n equals 1 theory, still an interesting cartoon. Okay. Okay. So I think we can uh, uh, stop for now apart from questions and comments.